Hello everyone and welcome to another exciting Pathfinder 2E tutorial. I am Jason Bullman, I'm the creator of the Pathfinder role-playing game and the director of game design at Paizo, and today I am going to be joined by my good buddy, Dan. Hey there, Dan. Hey. What is happening, Bullman? How are you? Not, uh, you know, things are going well. It's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been a long couple of weeks and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I, I'm glad we could get together again here today. Dan, I want to talk about magic. What do you know about magic? Well, let's see. It starts with uh, activating mana, and you can no, do... no, 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 not that one, not that one. <laughs> oh, then not nothing. That one. Then, then apparently nothing, because uh, <laughs> I, I'm a lifelong rogue, man. And here's the thing: we had a conversation last week about this, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm actually playing a spellcaster now." And you're like, "Oh, what are you playing?" I'm like, "A thaumaturge." You're like, "That's yeah, that's, no, that's, that's not, not the a spellcaster." <laughs> <laughs> so I know nothing. Well, nothing at all. So what you've clued in on is is in fact uh, a, a very large part of Pathfinder 2E and it takes a lot of different expressions. So you're playing a Thaumaturge, which isn't what we would call a spellcaster, but there are a lot of classes in Pathfinder that dabble in magic in various ways, shapes, and forms. And the Thaumaturge is one of those. Um, but, you know, you can get spells as a, a ranger, right? Champions get spells. But when we're talking about a spellcaster, we're really talking about somebody who gets a lot of spells. And for those, um, you know, that is a, an extra step of character creation. Um, there is kind of an extra bit of complication that folks need to learn, um, you know, and it gives you a lot of extra choices you can make to kind of customize your character. Now, one of the things we're not going to go over here in today's tutorial is we're not going to go through all of the in-depth character creation steps again. We did that video. If you're interested in watching that video, I'm going to go ahead and throw a link right up here so that you can uh, go and catch our previous character generation video. Uh, and Dan will probably be covered up by that. So who knows what's happening behind there? No, he's back. No, Jay, All right. You're, you're, you're going to cover up the brand is what's going to happen. That Pathfinder <laughs> logo is going to get obliterated, my friend. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so... Uh, before we before we dive into talking about how to build a character, I think the first thing we're going to want to do, honestly, is just kind of talk about how spells work in Pathfinder 2e. I think that's a good place to start, because once you know that, then you'll come to realize that the character choices actually aren't all that complicated at all. So let's go over to our, our, our working page here. Let's hop over to here. And between us here, I have the spells chapter. Now, this is chapter seven of the core rulebook. You can find it starting on page 297. Um, and this chapter starts off with kind of describing how spells work, how they, how you can read a spell entry, and kind of describing some of the flavor that uh, infuses the spells that lets you kind of more easily understand them. So, um, then it's followed up by all of the spells, which is why this chapter looks just so damn huge <laughs> in the book, because it, there are hundreds of spells in here. But really, as a character, you're only going to need to know a handful of them. But we got to give you all of them so that you can play characters from, you know, neophyte starting fledgling spellcasters to, you know, mages of the mightiest power. So, Dan, yes. did you know that there are four traditions of magic in the game. Yep. <laughs> can you name them for me, Dan? Dude, I can. Yeah. Uh, there's Copperfield, Henning, and <laughs> Teller. That, that's, no, that's not it. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Got I, him. I've, I've led you astray again. Uh, no, there are four traditions of spellcasting. I'm going to go here to this page because it talks about the spellcasting traditions. So the four traditions are arcane, divine, occult, and primal. Now, basically, these are groupings of spells. So there's arcane spells. These generally have things to do with elemental magic and mind control magic and things of that nature. There's divine spells, which focus more on uh, the soul and the body and the spirit. Um, there are occult spells, which focus a bit on soul and a bit on mind. And then there are primal spells, which have elemental 
um, uh, effects and like body and, and physicality effects. So the way this works is you can kind of think of the four traditions as if they were in a big wheel together. And the, the ones that are next to each other share some common things together. Now, the spells themselves land all over the place. There are some spells that are in all four traditions. There are some spells that are only in one or two. But these four traditions make up the lists, right? So here later on, we're going to end up going to the spell list. And I'm going to bump down to them now. And this is what the spell list look like. And you notice this is the arcane spell list. So this is all of the arcane spells. And it starts, you know, with the, the cantrips and lower level spells before working up to the higher level spells. Then starts the divine spells, right? So all of these lists are there to kind of form a category of spells. And as a spell caster, you will generally have access to only one of these lists. So when you're building your character, you might be an arcane spell caster or a divine spell caster or an occult spell caster or a primal spell caster. Now, Oftentimes in the classes, there are additional ways for you to kind of cheat and get spells off other lists. But we'll get okay. into that a little later. All right. So let's, let's hop back up here to the top, because that's not the only way we describe spells. There's another very basic way that spells are described in Pathfinder 2E, and that is magic school. What is the school of spell that it is? And there are eight schools... Abjuration, Conjuration, Divination, Enchantment, Evocation, Illusion, Necromancy, and Transmutation. And these, these aren't so much rules-bearing. They're there to give you a sense of what the spell is. They're kind of like a cheat sheet descriptor, right? So Abjuration spells are protective in nature. They, generally speaking, are wards and things that, that, that will protect you from harm. Conjuration spells, generally speaking, summon things to you. If you want to pull a creature out of nowhere and have it fight for you, that's probably a conjuration spell. Conjuration spells also create things out of nothingness. So if you've ever had a spell that just like, oh, I'm going to create food and water, that's a conjuration spell. Divination spells, kind of what it sounds like on the tin. They allow you to divine the future and see things far away and detect things most of all of your detect spells are divination uh enchantment spells befuddle and control people um they put you know charms on people and things they also can put uh charms and wards on objects all sorts of things like that evocation spells generally speaking blow things up <laughs> your fireballs your lightning bolts those are all evocation spells Let's, let's uh, bookmark that one for later. That's yeah, fine. no, I can't imagine why you might be interested in those. Uh, because they're fun. That's why you're interested in those. All right. Uh, illusion spells create illusions, either in the mind or in reality. They fool the senses. Sight, sound, hearing. You can also use them to hide things. You can turn things invisible using illusion magic. Uh, necromancy deals with the power of life and death. It infuses things with life. It can steal life from them. Uh, all of your healing spells, generally speaking, are necromancy. So necromancy isn't all bad, but necromancy is also where you animate dead things, right? <laughs> to do your bidding. I mean, you take the good, you take the bad. Yeah, and that's how you end up with necromancy. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to get a copyright strike. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Believe me, we, we neither one of us sing well enough to get a copyright strike. <laughs> that is I'm fair. Sure we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. Uh, yeah, maybe with some powerful illusion magic. Uh, <laughs> then uh, the, our last school is transmutation, and transmutation generally transforms things. If if you've got a spell that allows you to turn into a giant flaming elemental, that would be a transmutation spell. But it could also be something as simple as uh, you know allowing you to move real fast. Right? It just alters your your physicality. Your physical. So. That's kind of the, the real basics. Like, those are how we describe spells. The, the spells have a school, and then they are of a tradition that allows you to access those spells. So um, that's kind of the basics. Now, there's a whole bunch of other information about spells as well, and we'll get to spell slots here in a second. I don't want to touch on those just yet. But I do want to talk a bit about um, how spells are kind of read. They have components, they have range, they have area, duration, saves, targets, all that kind of stuff. And all of that is just there to kind of tell you how the spell works. 
you know, I don't need to explain what duration is. That That's how long it lasts. I don't need to tell you what the area means. That just says this is the area of the spell, right? A lot of that stuff is pretty straightforward. Now, one thing that is important to know is that all spells have a level associated with them. And that level, generally speaking, determines their power. And, and spell levels um, go from 1 to 10. 1 being spells you can get at first level, 10 being spells you can't get to, like, you know, the highest levels of power. Um, okay, so spell level is not... Can, it doesn't match with your character level. Those are two different things. Correct. That is something okay. that folks okay. oftentimes get confused. Spell level goes from 1 to 10, and as a spell caster, you usually get access to a new level of spells every other level. So you don't get third level spells until you are a fifth level character. Okay. All right. So um, one thing that is important to note, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce down to some spell descriptions here. Excuse me for going real fast. Um, some spells have heightened entries. So, for example, the spell that we're looking at here is animal form. Now, this is a transmutation spell. allows you to turn into an animal. Pretty cool. Um, and you can get this as a second level spell. But it has higher level versions as well. It can be heightened to third, fourth, or fifth. If you cast it as that higher level spell, it has a greater effect. So you're going to want to look out for that. But, you know, here today, we're probably just going to make a first level character. So we're not going to have to worry about that. But sometimes okay. when you're making choices about what spells to get, knowing how they heighten later on is really important. And some and spells height heighten okay. automatically. Okay, I was just going to say, and heighten is something you have to activate, or does it happen automatically? So, there's a bit of a <laughs> distinction there that's going to be worth going over. You've, you've okay. picked up on something that's really important. And, and that Big thing brain. is, what type of spell it is. Okay. So, hang with me here, because this is, this is, this, there's, a, there's a bunch here to absorb. Pathfinder has four different types of spells. Okay. One is the most common. These are the, these are spells, right? We just call them spells. We don't even put a, an additional word on them. Your spells okay. are, are just kind of like burning hands and invisibility and fly and lightning bolts and, and all that sort of stuff. Those are just spells. You will get access to them through your class, assuming you are a full spellcaster, and it will tell you how many you get and how many you can cast. And generally speaking, you have a limit to the number of them that you can cast per day, depending on your class. Um, some will give you a certain number of slots to work with. Others will say prepare a bunch, and once you use them all, they're gone. We'll kind of cover that here in a bit. But the important thing to know is that those are the bulk of the spells. Now, there are... Th there are a few other types of spells that are important to know. The first one, really critical, are cantrips. Cantrips are very similar to all of your other spells. They're, they're very similar in that they are even written and contained with all of the other spells in this chapter. But instead of saying spell 2 or spell 4, they just say cantrip uh, in their description. Here, let me, let me bounce down and show you what I mean. Um, so if I come down here, I've got acid arrow says spell two and down below it, I have acid splash that says cantrip one. So acid splash is a cantrip and all spellcasters get all full spellcasters get a handful of cantrips. Now cantrips are special for two main reasons. One, they automatically scale to the highest level of spell that you can cast. So as you okay. go up in level, they automatically become more powerful. They still take up a cantrip spot, but they gain power as you go up in level. So let's take a look at Acid Splash here. Acid Splash deals 1d6 acid damage plus one acid splash damage. That's what it does at first level. Once you reach, once you get third level spells, it heightens to third. Now you might ask yourself, what happens when I get second level spells? Nothing. There is no heightened entry for second. <laughs> Nothing. Um, but there is one for third. And at third, the damage increases from a D6 plus to a D6 plus your spell casting ability modifier and the persistent damage on a critical hit increases. to. Then at fifth, it goes to 2D6. At 
7th, it goes to 3d6, and at 9th, it goes to 4d6, plus your ability modifier does 5 persistent damage and 4 splash damage, right? So it, it really becomes quite powerful. Now, that's yeah. also when you're casting incredibly powerful spells. That's when you're dropping meteors on people. This, by comparison, isn't a lot, because the thing to it that's important to remember about cantrips, they're not as powerful as your full spells. So Acid Arrow here, the second level Acid Arrow spell, is generally speaking more powerful than Acid Spell. And it's more powerful because usually you only get a few Acid Arrows per day. But that's the other thing that makes Cantrip special. You can cast Cantrips as often as you like. They don't ever get expended. So it's Okay, so a, it's like an always loaded gun. It's yeah, just, yeah. just fire can, them off whenever you, you can, want. You can cast Acid Splash every single round if you Okay. So that's the value of cantrips. That's what makes them different than spells. They're a little less powerful, but you can cast them all day. So it, one of the advantages to this is that if you are a spellcaster, you don't have to be like, well, I guess I break out a crossbow, right? You know, you don't have to do something that you're fundamentally not good at. You can, you can still throw magic. It's just not as powerful magic. Okay. So okay. that's kind of fun. Now, we do have two other types of spells. The next one are called focus spells. Now, focus spells are special in a couple of ways uh, and are generally kept entirely separate from these spells. So they're at the end of the spells chapter. Um, they're way down here. I'm going to jump really far to get to them because, as you can see, they're way down here. So focus spells are tied to your class and you get access to them from your class and usually through the choices you make during character creation. So you'll notice here, these are bard spells, including the ever popular Inspire Courage. That is a bard focus spell. Now, focus spells are different uh, because... These are the most common spells for non-spellcasters to get. So champions get focus spells. They don't get a full bevy of other spells to cast. They just get focus spells. But bards, who are full spellcasters, also get focus spells. As do sorcerers, as do clerics, as do wizards. So focus spells are special because they are... Uh, they uh, auto-scale, just like a cantrip. Okay. All right. So they always go up if they're heightened. Not all of them are, right? You can see here, you know, Dirge of Doom doesn't have a heightened entry. Nothing special happens. Some of these don't really have much special about them at all, but some of them do, right? And if they do, they auto heighten and you get to use them uh, again and again. So these are the champion uh, ones. Here are the cleric ones. Um, another thing that makes focus spells special is you you know a bunch of focus spells. You gain them through your, your class ability. But you don't have to decide which ones you cast until you're ready to cast them. And that is because they don't use slots. You don't prepare them. They use focus points. So whenever you gain focus spells, generally speaking, you'll get a pool of one focus point. Now, you might be saying to yourself, why is that any different than a, than a spell slot? Why would you give me just a separate pool. Well, the difference right. is, is that during the day, you can get your focus point back. Oh, okay. So it's not quite as flexible as a cantrip. You can't just cast your focus spell over and over and over again. But every time you are out of combat, you can spend 10 minutes taking a special activity called refocusing. And when you refocus, you basically do something important to your class. So if you are a bard, you might go and work on a, 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 a composition that you're, that you're writing. If you're a cleric, you might read through your holy book. If you're a uh, sorcerer, you might just focus on your inner calm and the, and the power within you. But basically, you just take 10 minutes to do your thing. And at the end of that 10 minutes, you get a focus point back. Okay. All right. So it's not something that you can just fire off like a cantrip, but if you take the time 
yeah. to kind of slow down the adventure, say like with a short rest or something, yeah. then you'll be able to get that back. It's just yeah. not as easy kind of thing. Well, and this is one of the things about Pathfinder 2E. We give you a lot of reasons between a fight to take a 10 to 20 minute breather, right? Okay. You can do medicine checks. You can repair a shield. You can get your focus point back. And that means that next time you get into a fight, you'll be able to cast one of your focus spells again. Now, as you go up in level, you might find yourself with multiple focus points. There is a trick to this. If you end up with like three focus points, if you use one after a fight, you can refocus, but you can't refocus, 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 and go back up to full. You can only okay. refocus once between uses of focus points. So if you use, some, if you use three focus points during one fight, between that fight and the next fight, you can get one back, but you can't get two back. The next time you'll be able to get all the way back up to three is the next day when you next rest. day. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, okay. So I see how that how it's kind of nerfed. So it's going to be a little bit more important than a cantrip, but yeah. it's also a little bit harder to keep using it throughout the day. Yeah. Like unlike a cantrip. Yeah. So there are actually focus cantrips as well, which count as focus spells, but they don't burn a focus point. A lot of the barred ones fall into this category. And those are kept special uh, in that in that bucket because we didn't want them to take up your cantrip slots. Uh, because oh. the bard, bard would always have to prepare it. They just get it for free. Okay. Uh, I gotcha. And they can cast it as much as they want. And Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. I like that. It's kind of flavorful, yeah. you know. Yeah. Now, there is one last type of spell that I think it's worth talking about, but... Honestly, we're not going to focus on it too much. And the last thing are rituals. If we go down here, we'll get to rituals. They're down here after all of the focus spells. Here they are. Rituals are powerful communal spells you cast together. So if you want to resurrect someone, that's a ritual, not a spell. It doesn't eat up your spell slots, but you have to have the ritual, you have to know how to cast it, and you have to have enough people who are capable of helping, right? So rituals are kind of complicated uh, little uh, uh, rules packets that allow you to do kind of mostly story things, right? So okay. if you want to blight an area, if there's a bunch of evil druids preparing to destroy a town's crops before the harvest, they might gather together to do a ritual of blight and blight the area. Um, if you want to, you know, call a planar entity to serve or help you, that is a ritual. These aren't spells. They're big deals. They're big magic. And generally speaking, as a character, they're usually part of a story and not necessarily something that you just pick as part of your character creation. I'm going to resurrect <laughs> right. people. No, there, there, there are spells that allow you to bring people back from the dead quickly, but the ritual allows you to kind of bring back someone who's been, whose body's been mostly destroyed, right? Where raised dead isn't even going to do that. So um, there, there are some, there are some, there are some advantages to rituals, but they're big things. And, and frankly, we probably don't have to talk about them much more beyond this little bit right here. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So those are the types of spells. So Dan, do you have any questions about that? Did that all make sense to I you? Do. Did you follow along on that? It, it did make sense. The only thing that I'm not 100% sure about, um, so the, the schools of magic, right? Yeah. Is that something that I have to pick beforehand and then I'm locked into those spells only because I chose that school? So, or is that just informational? So the tradition is generally determined by your class or a choice you made in your class. The okay. schools don't usually matter for most characters. Okay. So you can have spells from all different kinds of schools. There are some types of wizard that care about what school of magic, because wizards can kind of focus in and be like, I'm an evoker. I do evocation magic, and I don't like some of these other spells, but I get bonuses on evocation magic. So they, okay. they might focus on certain schools of spell, but generally speaking, most characters don't have to care. Okay, okay. Yeah. So f for the most part, in general, it's just going to be good information to know, but yeah. it might be important depending on the choices you made when you created your character. Correct, correct. Okay. okay. All right. So I think what we're going to do, Dan, is we're going to start by working to uh, make 
uh, a character here. Now, to keep things interesting, instead of going through all the character creation options, um, I've started by just kind of pulling some data, and I think what we're going to have you do is walk through the process of doing the spell and the, the, the spell choices for a sorcerer. So I've grabbed uh, I've grabbed Sione here. She's gonna she's gonna Sione. hover hover above you there, and Dude, the uh, we're art, gonna. I, I just gotta say really quick, the artwork for uh you know for the main characters that's that are kind of like the representative of each class, just yeah. amazing. I, I yeah. love Paisa's artwork is just dope as fuck, man. Well, it's so I, good. You know we we're lucky to work with Wayne Reynolds, who is an amazingly skilled artist. This is his art, and uh, and he has done a fantastic job, not just illustrating these characters but imagining like if you ask him stories about their gear he'll tell you why they have those things like he's yeah. he has ideas in his head about why they exist it's it's amazing like he's a fascinating uh, dude Super yeah he's he's amazing and uh and uh, and a, a a great friend of paizo so uh what we're gonna do here is we're gonna we're gonna work on building a sorcerer so i've, I've got a character sheet here this isn't fully filled out i've just got you know sorcerer nomad uh, so, so we're not going to focus too much on, on this. The main thing we're going to want to focus on though, is this sheet here. This is the spell sheet. There's a lot of blank space in there, Bowman. I'm not going to lie. That, that is, is because spellcasters can have a lot of spells, but we're going to start you out at first level. So I, I can tell you're apprehensive, Dan, but we're going to get through this. Trust me, <laughs> Trust me, Dan. Do not expose my smooth brain here on your stream, Jason. I'm not cool with that. All right. <laughs> so we're going to hop back up here. And we're in the Sorcerer. So uh, the first thing you need to know about making a Sorcerer, I picked Sorcerer specifically because Sorcerer allows you kind of the widest flexibility of options. Um, wizards are all arcane. Clerics are all divine. Druids are all primal. Bards are all occult. Sorcerers can be any of the four traditions. Oh, okay. Can I, do I have to choose or can I pick and choose depending on what spells I want? Well, you will make the choice by determining what your bloodline is. So that is, oh. the, that is the key feature of a sorcerer. So sorcerers draw their power from their bloodline somewhere in their past. In their family tree, there is some sort of powerful magic, some sort of powerful magical being that exists somewhere in the distant past. And the power of that being has flown through the, through the years and has manifested in you in the ability to cast spells. So the first thing you need to do is pick your bloodline. Now, before we do that, I do also want to talk a little bit about the way sorcerers cast spells. So... Wizards um, prepare their spells. They have a book full of spells and they read those spells every day and they decide which ones of those spells they think they're going to cast that day and they prepare those. And then okay. as they go through their day, they cast the spells and every time they cast a spell, it's wiped from their memory. So okay. they, they basically prepare a list and then as you cast them, you just cross them out. And when your day is and, done, your day is done. And they so, know they technically know more spells than they can actually prepare for the day so that yeah. some of them they're not going to yeah. have access to because they didn't yeah. commit it. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, th that's how wizards work. Clerics also prepare their spells, but instead of having a spell book, they just pray to their deity. And in doing so, they have access to every divine spell on the list. They just get to pick which ones they prepare each day. Okay. Okay. Sorcerers are different still. Sorcerers have a bunch of spells that they know. So they don't have to do anything every day. They, they, every time they gain a level, they learn more spells and add them to their list of spells known. And then they can spontaneously decide which spells to cast. So they have a certain number of slots of each level per day. So if we look here at the spellcasting chart, the number of spells you know and the number of slots you have are the same. So... At first level, a sorcerer knows three spells and can cast three spells per day. That's first level spells. And you get five cantrips. So mm. what we're going to do is we're going to pick kind of your bloodline, figure out what type of sorcerer you want to be. And then we're going to go and pick five cantrips. 
and three first level spells. And once we've done that, I want to come back and do it all over again and make different decisions, just to show you how different these characters can be. All right? Okay. All right. All right. So we'll start with your bloodline. Now, again, here, everybody, we're only working with options from the core rulebook. Um, there are other books like Secrets of Magic and things like that that offer new bloodlines and new options and whole new spells and all sorts of things you can work with. But here today, we're just going to work out of the core rulebook just to keep it simple. There's so many additional options in Pathfinder, you could get lost in them for days trying to make the exact character you want to make. So today, we're just going to, I'm going to keep it simple on poor Dan here. <laughs> Thank and you. And, I appreciate that. And we're just going to go with this. Now, one of your choices here is your bloodline. And for a sorcerer, this is the important choice during character creation. So I'm going to read off the bloodlines to you, and then we'll pick one and go from there. There's the aberrant bloodline, which means you've got weird, unknowing, horrible entities lurking somewhere in your past. Aberrant, unknowable creatures. There is angelic, which means you have some sort of heavenly influence in your past. There is demonic, which means sinful demons are in your, your family blood. There is diabolic, which means infernal powers uh, fuel your magic. There is draconic. That means you have a dragon somewhere in the family tree. There is elemental, which means your, 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 your blood is infused with elemental power. There is fey. That means you get your, your power from the, the, the fey realm, the first world. There is hag, which means uh, you know the powers of the occult powers of hags is somewhere in your family blood. There is imperial, which means you have kind of an ancient power somewhere in your bloodline. And then there uh, is undead, in which case you have <laughs> undead power somewhere in your, in your family, <laughs> family tree. Now, your choice of this is going to give you a whole bunch of things, but before we even get to that, I, I, wanna, I wanna get your first take, Dan. Which one of these are you most interested in? Well, I look, as a rogue, I like the power of subtlety, so I'm going dragon, of course. Draconic, let's do it. I want, I, want a, I want a hoard of gold. I want a cave. I want a, all of that stuff. That's a great choice. That's actually um, what Sioni's bloodline is. So we'll start there, and then we'll come back and make a different choice. Um, all right, so Draconic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop down here because there is an entire section in the Sorcerer looking at your bloodline. So let's go down here to Draconic. So here it is. So Draconic, it says your spell list is Arcane. So you're an Arcane spellcaster. So we'll be picking all of our spells off of the arcane spell list. Okay, okay. You get some bloodline skills, so you get trained in arcana and intimidation. We go and mark that on your character sheet as normal. You get uh, some granted spells. Now, these are spells that you automatically know. Um, and as you go up in level, you will get additional granted spells. So if you look in here... Granted spells are, uh, you automatically have the spells listed here to your spell repertoire. That's your spells known. Mm -hmm. um, as described in spell repertoire. First level, you gain a cantrip and a first level spell. And then you gain the other ones as soon as you get to the highest, the level necessary to get them. So for you, you're automatically going to learn shield and true strike. So Ooh. let's go ahead and pop over here. And we're going to go in here and write... So really quick, Jason, shield and true strike, does that count against the five that you show that you had shown on the previous um thing? No. Or the, the was no. it three for no, first level, I think? These are okay, so it get these are on top of what I should normally start with. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So um if we look oh, you know what? I always forget that we made boxes for these. So over here we've got a space for cantrips, so I'm gonna go ahead and put shield in here. And over here in spells, I'm going to go ahead and put True Strike. Your cantrip level is going to be the same as your highest level. So that's going to be first right now. And then over here, um, it does say spell slots per day. And you get three first level spell slots. You notice cantrip isn't up here because you don't have cantrip spell slots. 
You just have cantrips. You just have cantrips. You just have them. So we're okay. just going to write all your cantrips in, and once we're done, we're done. Now, you okay. are an arcane spellcaster, so I'm just going to mark this. This is a handy form fillable sheet I found just by searching for form fillable pathfinder sheet. Um, you are a spontaneous caster, so we'll go ahead and mark that. And we've got true strike on here. We could start including information and stuff. I'll hold off on that for now. We're just we're just making some choices. Now, we get back here. That's your granted spell. Now, in addition to that, it says bloodline spell. You're probably wondering, what's a bloodline spell? You didn't describe bloodline spells. Well, that's correct, because bloodline spell is what sorcerers call focus spells. So this oh. is your focus spell. Okay. You get dragon claws. So I'm going to come back here, down here under focus spells, put dragon claws. And uh, your maximum number of focus points is going to be one. So I've gone and put that in. Um, I, I do want to talk about this box up here uh, really quickly, but I'll do that after I finish up the bloodline stuff here. Uh, okay. The last thing that's in here is dragon magic. Dragon scales grow glow or grow briefly on you or one target, granting a plus one status bonus to AC for one round. Now you're probably wondering what, what does that mean? So if we go back here, blood magic says whenever you cast a bloodline spell using focus points or a granted spell from your bloodline using a spell slot, you gain the blood magic effect. Uh, if the blood magic effect offers a choice, make it before resolving the spell. The blood magic effect actually uh, uh, resolves after uh, resolving any checks for the spell's initial effects. And against a foe, it only applies if it, the spell affects them. Yada, yada, yada. The point okay. here is, for your, your draconic uh, bloodline, whenever you cast shield, you can get a plus one status bonus to AC on top of whatever the shield bonus gives you. So your AC goes up even higher. Oh, Okay, and th that just kicks in. Like, that's just a thing because I activated it by casting my, so, um, not my cantrip, so it, but the, the blood I, I, I just realized it doesn't work on cantrips. So it's not going to oh, okay. work on shield. Sorry, my mistake on okay. that. I was, I, I'm glad I caught it because I knew that was going to end up in the comments below. Uh, <laughs> but wait, um, did, what's, what's the activator for it, though? Didn't so it say that you use your bloodline spell? The activator is using a focus point. So whenever you cast dragon. Oh, claws, I see. If I okay, because I'm not using the point though. That that's the big difference. Okay, got it. Or when you use a spell slot, and cantrips don't use spell slot. Okay. So okay, whenever you cast it. True Strike, you would get it. Okay. Whenever you use uh, Dragon Claws, you would get it. So um, this is the sort of thing we would probably uh, write in the notes here somewhere. Um, you know, there's. You can either put a note here or a note somewhere else. Uh, you might actually want to put it in like your class feats or features here, just as a reminder that that exists. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's the basics. Okay, that's the basics from your bloodline. So let's go back here and talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of your proficiency things. So there's a proficiency thing in here in spells. Now, when you're building a rogue, you don't see proficiency spells because rogues aren't proficient in any spells. <laughs> um, however, as a sorcerer, you are trained in spell attack rolls of your tradition and you're trained in spell DCs. So just like everything else, this is a standard kind of proficiency. So if we go back to the character sheet and we're going to go ahead and choose your spell casting ability score here, which is charisma. And then we're going to mark both these trained. And there you go. That's it. That's all we needed to do. This does the math for you automatically. Your spell DC oh, nice. is 16. Your spell attack roll is plus six. What does that mean? Well, that means if you cast Burning Hands, the DC for the enemies to save and take less damage is 16. If you instead uh, cast uh, 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 a ray spell that fi fires a, a freezing ray at someone and you have to make an attack roll, um, you would make you would roll a d20 and add six. That's it. That's just how oh, that okay. works. And as you go okay. up in level, those are going to go up. And it applies to everything. It's not based off the spell level or anything like that. Whenever anybody has to save against one of your spells, it's a 16. <laughs> and it's based off of charisma. That's the that yep. that's the stat that helps raise that. Okay. Yeah, that's described in the sorcerer. 
Um, uh, it key will, ability. It, says it will say. Right key there. ability. Yep, there it is. Okay. Um, got it. So that's kind of how all of that works. Now, we also have to pick some spells for you. So, um, Dan, you're playing a draconic sorcerer. What type of dragon you thinking? Oh, well, I have to. I have to go. I have to figure out what type of dragon. Not just that I have you don't, a dragon. You don't have to, Dan. But this is okay. one of the things in Pathfinder too, right? You can decide, you know, more bits of your story. So you could say, "Oh, it was a it was a powerful red dragon that I'm descended from," and as a result, all of my magic is kind of fire tinged. Okay. The reason I'm the reason I'm asking this is so that when we're picking spells, we can pick spells that kind of fit your flavor. Ah, uh, I okay, yeah, I like that. Uh, let's go. Uh, you know what? Let's go like a, a like a green like green. Is that acid? Green is acid, yeah. Let's do that. Let's go acid. Okay. So um, we will say that you had uh, a green dragon somewhere in your past, and as a result, acid flows through your veins and uh, and uh, can bubble up and boil and scorch your foes. So we need to go and pick spells. So you get five cantrips, three first-level spells. And if we go here, we go to spell repertoire, um... Okay, so these uh, these lists, these numbers do actually include the ones from your bloodline. Okay. So um, you're going to get to pick four cantrips and okay. two first level spells. Okay, okay. So yeah. they're not bonus. They're not bonus spells. Yeah, I just had to double check okay. that. I was like, is that yeah. right? No, wait. I think, <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I Listen, even when you make the game, sometimes you got to check the rules. <laughs> yeah. We'll fix it in post. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. If I if I get if I get called out every time I messed up a rule during a live play, boy, I, we would never get anywhere. Okay. Um so we need to pick uh five or four cantrips and two first level spells. So let's go here okay. to the arcane spell list. Now let's start with cantrips. Now, because of your theme. I'm just going to go and put Acid Splash on the list. Might as well. I think yeah. that's a good call. So Acid Splash is one of your four. No surprises there. Now let's kind of talk about the other spells that are on this list. We've got Chill Touch that hurts undead. Dancing Lights that makes kind of floating lights all over the place. Daze, which allows you to befuddle someone's mind. Uh, Detect Magic, which allows you to detect magic uh electric arc which allows you to zap two creatures um with a bolt of electricity between the two of them i know you're pointing at me because everybody knows that spell who's played pathfinder 2e and they're like yeah that's a good spell you should take it's that not spell. bad i'm just everybody, gonna say that <laughs> everybody likes everybody likes electric arc um there's ghost sound which lets you make kind of phantom ghostly sounds uh there's light which surprisingly creates light uh mage hand uh, which creates a floating ghostly hand. There's message, uh, which allows you to send a brief message to someone nearby. Prestidigitation, which allows you to do minor magic tricks. Nothing powerful, nothing broken. It, it Hey, you want to clean your clothes? Prestidigitation. Um, produce flame, creates a small ball of flame in your hand that you can throw or attack with. Ray of frost, fires a freezing ray at a foe. Read aura, allows you to kind of examine a magic item and learn about it um hmm. shield which you already know which basically conjures a uh a, a glowing uh invisible shield of force that blocks attacks and you can use it to negate some damage there is sigil um that allows you to basically put a mark on a thing that it, that people can't just wash off um there's Tanglefoot, which causes a uh, conjures a vine that tries to wrap around somebody and, and stop them. And then there's Telekinetic Projectile, which basically allows you to pick up something and throw it at somebody. Um, hmm. So those are all of the cantrips, Dan. Okay. You get three more. And remember, these are the spells you get to cast as much as you want all day. Right. So it's right. good to kind of take a balance here. Having an attack spell or two is good. Having hmm. some you know, uh, spells that allow you to do some utility things are also kind of good. So yeah. what do you think so about? Off the top of my head, what what's my vision situation with Sioni? Sioni is a human. 
Okay. Uh, so her vision is normal human vision. In the dark, she can't see. Let's go with light. Light? Okay. Yep. So I'm going to hop over to your character sheet here, and we're just going to go ahead and add light. I can't tell you how many times I've been stuck with a party where there's one person stumbling around like Velma lost her glasses, and we're like, where are you? And they're like, I can't see anything. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be that person. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> so you still get, you still have two more. Yeah. Uh, electric arc. Electro, uh, electric arc. All right. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm Done. shocked. But... <laughs> electric um, does, arc. Does Tanglefoot actually help other people get a better chance to hit? Does so, it affect it like that? Tanglefoot um, really just kind of prevents foes from moving. Uh, that's its okay. best thing is that it, it prevents them from moving around. Uh, okay. But... Um, I mean, we can they, we can go look it up. Let's go take a look. Yeah, because I have the whole spell can, chapter here. So if it's something I can just like be like, uh, oh yeah, you're tangled now, and then it helps the party. You know, whoever's maybe doing melee, that might right. be fun. So here's Tanglefoot. Find this on page. Uh, what is that? Three seventy seven. Yeah. Uh, a vine covered in sticky sap appears in thin air, flicking from your hand and lashing itself to the target. Attempt to spell attack roll. On a critical success, the target gains the immobilized condition, takes a minus 10 foot penalty to its speeds for one round, and takes a minus 10 penalty to its speeds for one round. It can attempt an escape artist, uh, escape check against your spell DC to remove the penalty in the immobilized position condition. On a success, so if you don't get a critical success, it just reduces their speed by 10 feet. Okay. Um, so it's not going to help anybody hit, but it is useful in preventing somebody from escaping right? right if there's a bad guy trying to get away from you or you're trying to get away from a bad guy that's what tangle foot is really best okay okay um boy i i do i do like the the idea of being able to stop especially like when you're fighting somebody and you get that that one character that just moves around all over the sure. place and say a rogue or something so you know? yeah uh, tanglefoot is certainly very useful i don't think it's a bad spell at all it 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 certainly has its uses they're a little situational but that doesn't mean yeah. it's a bad spell um so tanglefoot be a fine choice i would also say that i oftentimes see people take detect magic but detect oh, magic isn't yeah. as useful until higher level i actually no i i do want to take detect magic i think that's a good one to take um right. i totally forgot that that was a cantrip oh yeah no worries so let's go ahead and grab you detect magic here. And that is that. That's your that's your that's your that's your cantrips. You're done on that front. Now, first level spells, there's a lot of them here. Mm -hmm. So instead of just I mean, you know, they, they go from it's over an entire column. Now, I will say this, Dan, there isn't an acid spell really okay. kind of in there. There's a second level acid spell, but there isn't really a first level acid spell now that said um there are you know spells that do damage for sure if that's something you're looking to grab um but uh you know what are you kind of thinking about for spells now you do have true strike um true strike is pretty damn useful we go in here and check true strike uh the next time you make an attack roll before the end of your next turn roll twice and use the better result Okay, I like that. I like so, that a lot. But you already have that spell. That That's yes. one you got from your bloodline. Yeah, and I get two more? You get two more. Okay. So if you're looking for an offensive spell, let me mm -hmm. tell you what your options are. You yeah, can yeah. take Burning Hands, creates a cone of flame in a short area. Uh, there is Color Spray that doesn't do damage, but it can stun and dazzle foes. Um, there is... Um, Goblin Pox, which is a necromancy spell, which affects someone with a minor disease. Not really useful in the middle <laughs> of a fight, uh, no. but is fun. Grim Tendrils creates kind of a, a, a lash of black, inky darkness that damages everybody in a line. There is um, uh, the ever-popular Magic Missile, uh, which is an interesting spell. One thing that's important to note here, because we kind of glossed over it before, most spells take two actions to cast. Not all of them, but most spells take two actions to cast. Magic Missile is one of the weird ones that can be cast using one, two, or three actions. 
and you get one missile for each action you spend to cast the spell. Oh, okay. Each missile automatically hits, and each missile does a d4 plus one damage. So if you want, you know, most of the time when people cast magic missile, it's to cast it for all three actions to get the most out of the spell. Right, um, right, that, right. Okay. That is an option. Um, there's Ray of Enfeeblement, which makes a creature weak. Um, and we got Shocking Grasp that does pretty decent electricity damage. Um, and then that's about it for your main attack spells. There's also Sleep, which puts creatures to sleep. Um, and Spider Sting, uh, which does some poison damage. So... Hmm. I so I feel like I want to do grim tendrils. I like that. All right. That that sounds fun. Uh, right. And it's got you know it's got multiple the potential for multiple people in one go. It does. It's it's a very solid first level spell. So we got grim tendrils. Okay. Now you got true strike. You got grim tendrils. Now I feel like usually my advice to people making first level characters is get an offensive option or two, and then get something that frankly sounds fun or useful to you um mm. you know getting having three attack spells might give you the right tool in some situations but more often than not you're going to be like well this is the best of those three so i'm just going to do that all things being equal i'm just going to do that mm -hmm. right um so let's talk about some of the other utility spells that are floating around here um there's air bubble which allows you to create a bubble of air around someone so they can breathe like underwater there's alarm that just creates a kind of magical alarm in an area. Ant Hall, which lets people carry more. Charm, which allows you to charm a person and get them to be your friend. Um, command, which is, this is also, some of these fall into the realm of like, you could find an offensive use for this. Uh, like command is like, hey, you flee, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, can also be used in other situations as well. Great water, not too useful for, for a first level character. Um, fear. I, I guess we skipped fear. Fear makes creatures run away. Uh, feather fall, which prevents falling damage. Uh, fleet step, which makes you fast. Uh, floating disc, which lets you carry stuff. Um, grease, uh, which just makes things slippery. Um, gust of wind, which allows you to blow things around. Hydraulic push, which is actually an attack spell that allows you to kind of do a blast of water uh, against oh, okay. one character. Illusory disguise, which allows you to change your appearance. Illusory object, which allows you to create a fake object. Oh, okay. Um, item facade, which allows you to make disguise an item to make it look shoddy or nice. Uh, lock, which locks a door. Jump, which allows you to jump real far. Mage armor, which protects you. It's a protective spell that gives you a bonus, uh, gives you magical armor that you can wear. Because as a sorcerer, you can't wear armor. Right. Not really. Right. Um, uh, you're, that, you're not trained in it, so... <laughs> would, would that stack with something like shield? Yes. So I could put them both together? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm thinking, now, may, maybe I'll... Uh, I'll take your advice. My, yeah. my first thought was Featherfall, just because. Like, that sounds like it would be something fun to do, uh, you know. Uh, but if, Featherfall is if not a hurry. bad spell. Um, It is a spell that doesn't, like... It's, it's, it's a spell that... When it's useful, it's really useful, but yeah. in all other situations, you're like, eh. <laughs> it's just self. It's just yeah. me, right? It's not like I or could I? No, you can save. One... You can save other people with it as well. Oh, okay, all right. Well, there's that. Um, but I I do like the idea of the of the armor. I, I think that might be good. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with taking mage armor. Um, just looking down the list here, some of the other things that might be worth considering. There is summon animal or summon construct that allows you to get a minor servant to help you or fight for you. Um, those are kind of useful or can be useful. There's pest form that allows you to transform into like a mouse um, and go stealth uh, around a place <laughs> like as, as something tiny and, and in a, unobtrusive. Um, uh, so I, some I think of those I'm going mage things. armor. I, if, that, it, it's hard to beat that one. Like that sounds like it's probably the best thing to to do at, at right now, anyway. So I mean, you know, honestly, if that's if that's what you're feeling, then then go with it, right? So yeah. Um, so there we go. That's mage armor, and that's that's kind of it, Dan. You've you've built a sorcerer. Done. That's I know. How, I know how. To, I know magic. I feel that's like right. Keanu Reeves all of a sudden. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, you know what you would what here's the loadout you would have every day. You mm -hmm. would be able to go on your adventures, and each day you could cast three 
first level spells. So you could cast True Strike, Grim Tendrils, or Mage Armor. Any combination of those, you can cast three per day, right? Um, okay. So that's that's what you get. Uh, in addition to that, you can use Dragon Claws. Now, we didn't actually look at Dragon Claws, but you know what? Let's go take a peek at what Dragon Claws. Oh, I forgot about Dragon Claws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to come down here. Need to find the Sorcerer spells. Here they are. So Dragon Claws is right here. It's on page 403. Vicious Claws grow from your fingers. They are finesse unarmed attacks that deal 1d4 slashing damage and 1d6 extra damage of a type determined by your dragon bloodline. You picked green, so they are going to do poison damage. Oh, nice. Oh, you know what? I think we were, I was assuming acid because you went, uh, you went green. Uh, yeah. But green is actually poison damage. I forgot that was oh. fine. So, um, oh. still works. I'm, I'm okay with the poison, still good. Yeah. Um, uh, your scales uh, from blood magic glow with a faint energy, giving you a resistance five to the same energy type. So you would get uh, poison uh, resistance for five while this spell was up as well. So if you got poisoned, activating Dragon Claws would mean you would take five less damage from poison uh, for, for one minute. That's not bad. Some yeah. some of the most frustrating uh, encounters I've had is when I, you'd get poisoned or some kind of you know thing like poison is not yeah. great when it happens. You're it like, occurs to me that if you did want to stick with the acid, you could always change to black dragon um, instead of green, uh, which would allow you to keep. I forgot we changed green to poison. Oh, um, but regardless, yeah, let's stick I, with I, it. I, I like poison. I still think we've we've made a fun uh, uh, build here. So one thing I do want to do here really briefly, instead of making all the decisions, I want to, I do want to hop all the way back okay. and let's pick a different bloodline here briefly and just see what that does. So okay. instead of picking draconic, what other bloodline sounds kind of interesting to you? Let's, let's find one that, that is, <laughs> that is radically kind of different. I would have, I was going to do uh, undead is what, that was the second one that I was thinking was okay. undead. So if you picked undead, you would be a divine spellcaster, not an arcane spellcaster. That that's going to radically redefine what your character can do. So okay. we'd go down here, we'd look at the undead bloodline. And the undead bloodline is going to give you divine magic. It's going to give you intimidation and religion, whereas before you got, you know, arcane and uh intimidation. So this is going to give you intimidation and religion. Um instead of true strike and shield. You would gain Chill Touch and Harm. Harm is a spell that you can cast using one, two, or three actions. For one action, it it does damage to a single living target that you touch. For two actions, it does even more damage at range. And for three actions, it's a burst of energy that harms all living creatures within range and heals all undead within Oh, holy moly, that sounds good. Wow. Yeah. Um, they do get a save, but you know how heal spell works whenever we play? When mm -hmm. folks can spend one action to heal themselves or a, a touch target a little, two to heal for a whole bunch, one target, and then three to heal everybody in range. Harm right. is that, but just in reverse. <laughs> <I like it. laughs> That's pretty amazing. Like yeah. that, that that seems pretty dope. You also get instead of the dragon claws, you would get something called Undeath's Blessing. We'll go take a look at that here in a second. And then your blood magic is necromantic energy flows through you or the target. Either you gain temporary hit points equal to the spell's level for one round, or the target takes one negative damage uh, per spell level. So, like, whenever you cast harm, you can give yourself temporary hit points or harm the target for more damage. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, that... There, there's some pretty good benefits right there in that little yeah. bit. Like, that's pretty so, amazing. So let's then hop down here. First thing I want to do is go take a look at Undeath's Blessing. That's going to be way down here. And again, folks, I chopped up the, the core rulebook PDF just to show what we needed to show. Uh, so <laughs> if you think I'm jumping around real fast, it's because I've cut out everything that isn't important. 
Um, so Undeath's Blessing here says you instill within a creature the touch of the grave. For the duration, harm and heal spells treat the creature as if it were undead. In addition, harm spells gain a plus two status bonus to the hit points restored to the target. So you could give yourself Undeath Blessing, have yourself be treated as an undead creature, cast harm to hurt all the living things around you, and heal you simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> that's not bad <laughs> i love that that's amazing so i, I feel um, like it's like let's make a deal and i feel like you're just showing me that i selected the box when i should have taken the curtain uh comparing <laughs> no, but, what <laughs> well but see so this is the other thing i want to show you though is we're going to hop back up here to the spell lists mm -hmm. because you're you're going to work off entirely different spell lists you don't get these arcane spells instead we're going to go over here to the divine spells so instead of getting kind of, you know, electric arc and acid splash and all that kind of stuff, your choices are chill touch, which you already get, which um, hurts the living and disorients undead creatures. There's daze. That was on the other list. There's detect magic. That's also on the other list. There's disrupt undead, which damages undead creatures with like a ray, but only affects undead. There's Divine Lance that throws divine energy at a creature um, uh, based on your deity's alignment. Oh, nice. <laughs> There's Forbidding Ward, which kind of wards uh, one creature from harm. Guidance gives someone a small bonus on a roll. No Direction kind of tells you what way is north. Uh, light, Message, Prestidigitation, Read, Aura, Shield, Sigil, and then Stabilize, which allows you to stabilize a creature at distance. So you wouldn't pick the same spells, right? You you don't have as many offensive options. I mean, you could take Divine Lance. That's not bad. Um, you could take, you could still take Light, um, but you might have to take, you know, if you wanted Shield, you would have to select it. It is on this list, so you could take it. Um, but, you know, so you got a kind of a different list of spells, but where the real difference is going to come in is your first level spells. Because Cleric spells, or Divine, sorry, Divine spells, are an entirely different kind of category of spells. There are a few spells that are on both lists, but not many. So Air Bubble and Alarm are there, but then you get things like Bane and Bless, which give everyone bonuses or penalties. Um, you get Command, Create Water, Detect Alignment. So if you want to be able to detect alignment in the area, that's in there, Detect Poison. Disrupting Weapon, which allows your weapon to harm undead creatures. So your undead bloodline could manifest in... Like, you're really good at hurting undead as well. You can control them, you can heal them, and you can hurt them. So you could take, like, Disrupting Weapon and Disrupt Undead and kind of have an undead focus um, in your character. Now, Heal is still in here. So is Harm. So you could get Heal as well if you wanted to be able to heal living creatures. Um, magic Weapon is in here, which makes a weapon very powerful for a brief period of time. Uh, you can also get Sanctuary, which allows you to protect... Uh, one creature. Creatures have to make a save if they want to attack that creature. All these sorts of options are available. Now, we're not going to go through and pick them all uh, because we, we kind of already did that. But but I wanted to show you how just that choice in the Sorcerer of what spell list you're working on, you now have a radically different character. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it is really... Uh, but it is cool, though, because it is so flavorful. The second I chose what the bloodline is, it everything just falls right in place. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh yeah, this is right in the lane. That makes sense, you know? So Yeah, well, and, and that choice allows you to kind of envision a story about this character, right? That's a big that's a big thing about Pathfinder 2 in general. But when it comes to picking out spells, some people view it as just kind of like, how can I get the most optimized best spell package? But spells are also a way you can express your character, right? They They are... You know, it's it's no different than being like, this is my fighter's favorite sword, right? This is my sorcerer's favorite spell is is kind of their their shtick. And, you know, having a good concept for that is going to allow you to make a character that's kind of flavorful and evocative and what you want to be playing at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, well, Jason, we've, we've got two characters now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we so, just, we just keep... That. We just keep racking up character <laughs> ideas here. Before you know it, we'll build a whole party and then we'll get some uh, some volunteers in to take them over and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go on a, a little adventure. 
Well, Dan, it does occur to me that we should probably sometime soon walk everybody through how combat works. And I can think of no yeah. better way to do that than to uh, grab your poor, unfortunate goblin character and Silo. send him on an adventure. Yes, so, I, uh, I agree. So maybe we'll do that here sometime soon. <laughs> I I would be down. I yeah. I mean, I, I built, uh, you know, I built the character. I want to see how it runs. You never yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope that this uh, tutorial here today kind of gave you a better sense of how to play a spellcaster uh, in Pathfinder and that although it can be kind of intimidating to look at all those spells and try and figure out what you want to do, in fact, once you start making a couple choices, it all narrows down pretty quickly into just a handful of decisions that allow you to make kind of a flavorful, interesting spellcasting character. All right, everybody, that's about all we got here for today. I want to thank you all for watching. Make sure to, uh, you know, like and subscribe and do all the things so that uh, the, the numbers here go up. That's important. Or people tell me I'm not good at this. So, uh, you know, do the thing. Uh, and thank you all for watching and we will see you next time.